Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Philippe. Sorry for the hassle. Thanks, Vic. All right, excellent. Um, so this presentation will be about half an hour long and then people can ask questions. It's a great turnout for a Friday afternoon and I really appreciate everybody's interest and support, including we have colleagues here from, from our department, from other departments, from other countries. I see my friend Renata Silvano um, as well as uh, friends from the government of, of Alberta. Uh, so welcome all. I'd first like to acknowledge that we're on Treaty 6 territories in the home, homeland of the Métis. I'm very honored to be able to present to you today about some, some issues related to um, what we're talking about as cooperative management of lands and resources in Alberta. I'm going to generally go over some key concepts talk about uh, some case studies and then look specifically at kind of opportunities and challenges um, related to those, those key issues. Um, it's an important uh, time in, in history right now uh, when we're um, asked to think about some of these issues of cooperative management or, or co-management of, of lands and resources. This work comes out of a uh, out of support or a grant uh, that was set aside um, for, for us to work collaboratively with Indigenous communities in Treaty 8 and Treaty 6 territories and the Métis settlements. Our friends in Lethbridge um, have a grant um, to work with communities in the Treaty 7 area, including Pecani uh, Nation. It's a tremendous opportunity to be able to support community-based research on this uh, theme. And certainly it, it's a critical time in Alberta's history and Canadians' history, uh, as well as uh, globally, when we look at um, you know, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples uh, that was recently embraced by the Canadian government and the government of British Columbia, um, you know, the outcomes of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission on residential schools in, schools in Canada, and we're, we're being asked to think about our colonial histories and the ways in which uh, those uh, histories have impacted um, and left a legacy of harm for many uh, communities across the province. And so there's, there's a lot of uh, questions and there are a lot of issues that uh, surround um, um, these, these um, paradigms and um, sort of rethinking what do we mean by reconciliation? Uh, what do we mean by consent? What do we mean by the rights of Indigenous peoples? So this presentation is a bit of a literature review, a little bit of an overview of, of some key concepts and, and um, uh, a secondary kind of re review of the literature and, and kind of the synthesis of uh, previous um, insights I've had working here in Alberta, but also in Northern Canada on um, co-management and cooperative management. And so it's kind of a launch point in asking people to, to, to think about um, some of these ideas in the event that you're interested in being part of this um, work that um, Indigenous communities are leading in Northern Alberta around cooperative management. Um, you know, the, the, the issues are, are uh, critical, you know, there's these um, agreements and protocols that are, that are set up that give us kind of a, a lens or, or a window through which we should start to understand our histories and our contemporary um, relationship to Indigenous people, to lands and resources. Um, we know, uh, you know, globally and, and certainly within Canada, we see a, a rising number of um, challenges of evidence uh, that change is needed, right? So the, the top picture on the left is a picture of what's going on on the East Coast right now in terms of uh, the conflict over Mi'kmaq uh, territory and rights uh, to lobster fishing. Uh, we see that daily in the news, the, the kinds of uh, tensions that exist between uh, Mi'kmaq and um, non-Indigenous fishers in that region. On the bottom left, uh, you know, the, the, the conflict and tensions around the unceded territory of the Wet'suwet'en and Gixan people and the development of a, of a pipeline in, the, in their territory, you know, has garnered international attention and uh, certainly behooves us to think about different 
um, kinds of lands and resource management um, questions and, and problems that we you know, have too long buried but, and need to resolve. But there's also ecological indicators or big blinking signs that change is needed. Um, the decline of or extirpation of the malign, uh, malign caribou herd um, in the Jasper region um, is, is one of the woodland caribou herds that is, um, you know, uh, gone from, from the province. Um, there are other herds, including herds from that area that are, are also uh, dangerously close to extirpation. Um, th this certainly should become a, a flag to us that that change is needed, not only in our relationship with Indigenous communities, but in how we, we conceptualize our relationship to the land or uh, to resources like uh, caribou. Um, the, the Malign Lake caribou herd is one, one example, um, but we, we've seen a, a rise over the last uh, 20 years, kind of a bit of a paradigm shift in natural resource management, where we're, we're th rethinking the value of centralized top-down approaches to natural resource management. Um, the collapse of the cod fisheries on the East Coast, the Atlantic cod stocks, is one very telling example of um, some of the failures of kind of the big science, um, the top-down management approaches. Um, it's led to mistrust and opposition uh, to government, but also kind of a rise in decentralization of uh, natural resource management, management and an increasing interest in uh, different kinds of knowledge systems, as well as different approaches to, to community engagement and participation where suddenly we're, we're paying a bit more attention to Indigenous knowledge, to citizen science. So there's are really unique opportunities, um, not only to address the social tensions that have emerged from things like the collapse of the cod stock, but also to greatly improve uh, management systems and the potential for sustainability or conservation outcomes. Um, so the, uh, you know, these opportunities um, are particularly important when we um, think about the uh, role of Indigenous peoples and uh, um, also recognizing uh, the uh, different kinds of land and resource management um, rights that exist uh, through uh, Supreme Court case law, you know, requirements for consultation, requirements um, to, to engage and respect Indigenous knowledge, whether through environmental assessment processes, land use planning processes, you know, or, or other initiatives under um, the United Na Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Another example, um, which John alluded to, is, is the uh, Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services and the um, ways in which the Convention on Biological Diversity also calls upon Canadians and other nations to think about the role of Indigenous knowledge. Sorry, you can hear my teenagers screaming in the background, which is a super fun way of doing a presentation. I just want to play you quickly uh, a little clip from um, uh, the Guardians uh, program, which is, or the Indigenous Leadership Initiative, you know, at the same time we, we see these challenges um, that exist around um, uh, and, and these requirements to uh, rethink resource management, there's also tremendous opportunity um, for communities to um, um, demonstrate their um, tremendous um, uh, skill and uh, connection to the land. Just let me tell my kids to stop screaming. That would be nice. That would be nice. Um, and I'll do that. Anyone else have kids at home that are screaming? It regularly happens during my classes as well. It's super fun. Does anybody have any questions at the moment while I, while I pull up my other screen? Okay, I think I got it.
Um, so just to reconnect from my earlier, earlier flow, uh, in addition to some of these key challenges and, and also opportunities that exist to, to rethink our history, our relationship, you know, the flag post, the, the real, um, you know, terrible crises that have emerged in relation to, you know, social conflicts on the East Coast, but also the, the complete extirpation of, um, of um, species from the Alberta landscape. There are also tremendously uh, exciting opportunities and um, examples of how Indigenous knowledge is contributing significantly to conservation. So I'll just play you quickly this one uh, clip from the Indigenous Guardians program, if I can make it work, um, in which you start to see some of the voices and capacities that um, ha have been developing or are certainly been developing for many years, but are um, um, been there for, for many generations, but uh, we're only now, uh, you know, across the country recognizing. So this is a, a little clip, if I can make it work. The guardianship program is a huge step for us because it's about preserving the land and preserving culture and preserving language. It's an essential thing to our community. A guardian acts as the eyes and ears in each respective territory. They ensure that everybody's following all the rules and regulations that are placed in all the GUI laws, our laws. We go out and monitor tourist activities, industry activities, fisheries, commercial and sporting. We also do environmental monitoring. A huge aspect of it is healing and getting back in touch with your Indigenous self. If there's healthy people that are happy and strong in their culture, and if they receive that from being on the land, then it's a huge investment. You're investing in a better society, in a better tomorrow. In 1973, I paddled on my own all the way down to Skangwai. All my life, I always heard it as a very strong spiritual place. There's so much brush and debris and everything all over when I got there, but it's just totally overgrown. So it took upon myself to start clearing the village, just trying to show the ancestors that somebody cared. Our land is uh, very important to us. We live on it, we breathe it, we work on it. It gives us life. Without it, we don't have an identity. The best part of being a guardian is being out on the land where your ancestors have lived for many centuries and just to get reconnect with Mother Nature and how your people lived off the land. There's a gap between the youth and the elders. By starting this program, you know, it's trying to bridge that gap, trying to create that spark to carry on the knowledge. We are sustaining our traditional territory not only for us, but for the whole world. Our ecosystem is so pure, we have so many trees, that we are cleaning up a lot of pollution. It means that we are here protecting Mother Earth in order for the rest of the world to live on her. That's a brief clip from uh, the Canadian Guardians uh, Network, um, which incidentally is um, being supported by many different organizations. The government of Canada has invested significantly in, um, in the Guardians Network, but amazingly, uh, Han Solo, a number of other incredible um, 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 world leaders, as well as in <laughs> movie, Movie profile folks like Edward Norton and um, what is Han Solo's name, real name? Um, I've forgotten them. Uh, essentially, it's well, well recognized um, outside Alberta, outside Canada, um, and it's not necessarily um, 
you know, as recognized here in Alberta as it is, for example, in the Northwest Territories and other uh, regions of Canada. Having trouble sharing my other screen. There it is. I'm still not as savvy at this um, as I'd like to be. Uh, you can have a look at the Guardians Network and some of the um, tremendous work that's being done. Another uh, um, you know, momentum, kind of social movement, um, in addition to the kind of Guardians Network, was, which is you know, the Guardians Network, the Watchmen, different community-based monitoring programs. There's just this, this uh, almost explosion of interest and capacity that's been built and support from different organizations from Ducks Unlimited to, you know, the Boreal um, uh, Institute to um, uh, numerous NGOs, as I said, globally. Another initiative, and um, there was a clip of Gloria um, Enzo in that last video, who is from Futsuget and the First Nation. There are numerous examples in Northern Canada um, where we're starting to see Indigenous um, protected areas developing and not just simply as protected um, lands and resources that should be kept away from people but essentially as cultural landscapes that indigenous people have uh, stewarded for for many generations and so you can start to see a little bit more about um, indigenous protected areas through that website our colleague scott Duguid at the government of alberta um, has uh, really provided tremendous leadership around some of the, the um, federal level efforts to move along IPCAs. Um, so we can learn more about that. And there's new IPCAs being developed here in Alberta in the Northeast. Um, just in terms of decision making, we're using cooperative or uh, terminology, using cooperative ma management you know, as, as kind of a dimension or another way of talking about a system of co-management. Um, Co-management being a system of shared decision making, making involving different actor groups. Um, it's a, an affirmation of um, the, the tremendous knowledge that exists uh, from different stakeholders. Again, this kind of rise in interest um, in a more decentralized, decentralized approach to natural resource management. Um, the value, of course, of, of involving people who are closest to those resources in in a kind of management system is that there's very tight feedback loops between uh, knowledge gathered on the one hand and decisions made uh, you know at different scales from individual to regional to provincial um, so by by having um, you know a co-management system that's deeply engaged with local people there's there's this tremendous opportunity for learning and more um, adaptive flexible and uh, uh, resilient kinds of management approaches. Uh, there are different ways of thinking about co-management. There's tremendous literature that's developed uh, here in Canada and Northern Canada. Some of the oldest co-management boards are uh, here in Canada. The Beverly Caminaria Co-Management Board, for example, which um, like the COD crisis on the East Coast emerged after uh, essentially a crisis of confidence in northern biologists who claimed that uh, Inuit and Dene people had overhunted uh, the, the Beverly and Kamenariak herds and um, you know there was tremendous conflict that that ha occurred at that time in the 70s and uh, when it became apparent that you know caribou actually hadn't disappeared or weren't um, in decline they'd actually just moved um, to another part of the range there was again this sort of crisis and confidence in science and uh, tremendous healing that had to happen with local uh, harvesters and so the development of the BQ board was kind of uh, you know this combined effort to improve the the conservation or the decision making around that herd but also to to recognize the tremendous um, capacities of, of the Denny and Inuit people in in the management of that herd um, you know, in the, in the uh, case of Alberta, you know, there, there are many reasons why we, we need to think, um, even, you know, for the, for the worst of us that don't um, think that, you know, there's any kind of environmental crisis of any kind and don't really feel like some of these social issues around treaty rights matter to them. You know, there, there are legal rights to consultation. Um, 
you know, there are different examples of, of also um, the ways in which treaty rights, um, rights to access to land are being articulated and, and addressed across Canada. Some examples in the Northwest Territories, exa for example, uh, you know, there's co-management of renewable resources, there's, there's um, co-management in, uh, in um, environmental assessment boards and land use planning boards, as well as in land and water boards. You know, so we're, we're you know, in this, in this movement or in this paradigm where we're well behind a lot of other uh, places in Canada that have moved toward reconciliation and the recognition of rights. Um, the um, co-management has also proven tremendously useful where there is a high degree of uncertainty um, or high degree of uh, normative um, values and different perspectives about the state of resources. Um, so certainly here in Alberta we've seen over many um, decades, you know, uh, different and conflicting views about, uh, you know, the state of the Athabasca River, for example, you know, caribou is another uh, certainly um, example where we have a high degree of uncertainty um, about not only the cause of the problems, but also the potential solutions. Um, so there are there are different um, uh, social and ecological outcomes that are um, critical. Um, in addition to, to ecological conservation, there are uh, there are a tremendous number of best practices, or as our colleague Danica Littlechild says, best and wise practices, based on both uh, science and indigenous knowledge. So really looking to Indigenous uh, elders and peoples who have um, many generations of experience uh, stewarding resources uh, for, for better insights about how to um, um, take care of the land, take care of those resources. So I'll provide some examples in a minute. Uh, but in addition to these ecological outcomes, also critically important uh, to think about the broader lens of social, economic and cultural benefits um, and this I'm, I'm framing a little bit more tactically, um, thinking about, you know, how do we convince the powers that be that this is an important um, kind of enterprise. You know, food security uh, outcomes, right, we're looking at the, the benefits of co-managing uh, resources that are critical to, to the food security of Indigenous peoples. We know that there are rising levels of chronic illness, such as type 2 diabetes across the country, but particularly among Indigenous communities. Um, this is very clearly tied to decreasing consumptions of traditional and country foods in many, many cases, and certainly this is extremely well documented in northern Canada. Um, so the, the, the capacity to recognize people's rights uh, to harvest and the tremendous value of, of species uh, to the food systems of Indigenous communities is key. Uh, the cultural continuity, the loss of cultural identity practices and knowledge, uh, we know to have happened over the last hundred or more years. Uh, and it's led to an increasing prevalence of social illness um, and it's well documented the, the um, kinds of historical trauma that results from um, different tactics of colonization, whether residential school or otherwise, um, leads to tremendous social illness. Um, so that's well documented. Here we have a, a tremendous opportunity to, to address what is a rising trend um, um, in, in different kinds of um, uh, social illnesses, uh, and which can be protective against um, um, social violence or, or self-harm, for example. Uh, so that the tremendous opportunity to heal and um, gain health benefits uh, that are food related, but also cultural important. And then more broadly, thinking about issues of reconciliation, um, you know, there are opportunities for um, broader um, kind of recognition and, and um, um, address of socio-political costs and conflicts such as those we're seeing on the East Coast um, and here in Alberta and in British Columbia. You know, and these create all kinds of social benefits across society, but also economic benefits as we have less um, uncertainty, um, less economic uncertainty, less, less conflict, there's, there's greater opportunities for economic certainty, um, which tends to attract investment. So if you're among the Jason Kenney group, you know, that might, might ring as being interesting or relevant. Um, so 
uh, important to recognize the ways in which you know we co-management and cooperative management may differ and and the teeth uh, that may or may not exist in a, in a sort of co-management kind of arrangement or a cooperative management arrangement are we really talking about complete control by uh, indigenous communities of their lands and resources even in northern canada where there are land claims settled like in the Inuvial region or the Gwich'in region you know there there are degrees of um, community uh, sovereignty or, or um, uh, control power in those those institutions um, here in Alberta you know this of course is Einstein's ladder of participation which I, I found today has had over 23,000 citations which I find shocking um, that Arnstein's work has been cited that many times, but thinking about you know where where are the institutions that you know the government of Alberta are, are starting to imagine might be possible on this ladder? Are we talking you know closer to something like informing you know uh, you know government organizations or the current authorities calling a meeting to tell people what's going on? Um, you know, that may be a degree better in some cases than what's happening now, um, but it's really just informing people of a particular kind of decision. You know, one step up from that consultation, what kind of consultation is that? Is that really simply telling people what's going on, listening but not really doing anything about it? Uh, you know, and then, so we kind of sit a little bit right there between informing and consultation right now if we're really talking about greater citizen control or or some kind of delegated power arrangement that's a really different shift in governance um, from where we we sit right now and and the current recognition of aboriginal rights and um, capacities to participate in decision making different mechanisms uh you know they're you know the idea of co-management or cooperative management people sometimes think it's a it's an agreement some kind of piece of paper that got signed and a boardroom and a group of people that get together quarterly or yearly. Uh, there are many different mechanisms or approaches to co-management that can be softer all the way up to, to you know legislated. So there are examples already in Alberta uh, for example where uh, you know there is some kind of informal management of a resource I can't think of too many right now. Um, certainly, uh, you know, the, the number of formal agreements, um, obligations created by policies um, are, are few. Uh, you know, there are some ad hoc kinds of arrangements that exist related to a species, depending on which government is in power, depending on, you know, whether the, um, you know, our good friends in AEP uh, are able to, you know, create a budget for a particular kind of effort. Um, that, you know, we kind of have ad hoc arrangements of, of co-management, um, but they're not necessarily sustainable. You know, the, the, the um, recognition of treaty rights and, and the potential for a land claim agreement kind of scenario like the Gwich'in Comprehensive Land Claim Agreement you know, or treaty entitlement, you know, may also be be feasible. Um, and certainly court cases like like some of the, the cases that have uh, gone forward from uh, Miccosukee Cree and elsewhere, you know, create some space to have these more equitable kinds of conversations and discussions, but uh, certainly there's some limitations there. Uh, it's important also to recognize the, the degrees of um, informal versus formal uh, laws and institutions. Um, by formal um, uh, decision-making structures and, and formal kinds of laws, kind of more thinking about things that are legislated, that are harder um, in, in terms of, or more rigid in terms of their structure. They're not necessarily as flexible, but they certainly have uh, some longevity. On the other end of the spectrum, you know, we recognize that there are many ways in which we govern our natural resources that are based on um, um, you know, social norms, or in the case of indigenous communities, uh, institutions or rules that aren't lit written down, um, sometimes called customary law, or as my colleague Val Napoleon describes, indigenous legal orders. This book uh, screen here um, is a book by John Boros, who, um, <laughs> who, um, um, 
I'm just reading the chat from Gleb. Uh, the, the, this book by John Burroughs, which, which uh, clearly um, uh, details the, the ways in which Aboriginal uh, communities in Canada have very uh, long standing histories of, um, of governance, self governance, and you know, th those systems, although not written down, um, are, are highly effective in, in managing lands and, and resources and addressing, you know, the, the other sorts of um, social conflicts, etc., that exist uh, often in society. Uh, so, so that's a whole other way of thinking about um, co-management, cooperative management, um, and the, the extent to which, you know, we, we overemphasize and you know, recognize the stuff that's been been proclaimed by the British Crown, but we don't recognize, you know, the the oral histories that underlie the governance systems of of Aboriginal people. Um, some examples of of uh, you know, you might think, oh gosh, what kind of social norms can be highly effective at conservation? That sounds really weak and not very useful. But there's tremendous uh, research around. Um, social norms or informal institutions, as Fickert Burkus calls them, um, you know, globally, for example, uh, sacred trees in Ghana, uh, there's tremendous research about how they've been uh, protected by, by cultural taboos and essentially, you know, forests that haven't been cut down or ha have essentially been uh, protected by by local people and their beliefs about the value of those, those trees. Um, some of the work we've done in Northern Canada around um, indigenous harvesting of caribou, very clear uh, you know, rules around take only what you need and the extent to which that has prevented or is, is kind of a, a belief and a norm that has uh, prevented um, situations of over harvesting. Uh, in the Mekong and Moon River Basin, uh, our colleague Ian Baird, for example, talking about um, fish sanctuaries, um, and how certain areas of, of the Moon River, both in Thailand and Laos, uh, you know, have become kind of de facto protected areas by virtue of the norms that exist. And uh, other work we've done here in BC in the Fraser Basin, Stalo rules related to the respect of, of white sturgeon um, have, have had tremendous power historically to prevent, uh, you know, over harvesting of uh, that species. But certainly those rules are not recognized by um, not recognized by, uh, you know, the BC government or, you know, within legislation on, on recreational fish, fishing, for example, or on commercial fishing. Um, another uh, critical um, study that, that evidences the, the importance of uh, customary law or different ways in which informal institutions matter uh, to conservation was a study released last year I guess it's two years ago now from UBC, uh, where they did a, an analysis of biodiversity on indigenous lands versus protected areas, uh, partic you know, more specifically vertebrates than fish species and identified the, um, the fact that on indigenous territories, biodiversity is higher, as high or higher than in areas protected um, centrally by government. Uh, and so this is a very clear uh, statement about the, the tremendous value of Indigenous law to conservation. Um, you know, why, why is that? Why does that work? Well, there's a quote here from my colleague Val Courtois from the Innu Nation who says, essentially, you protect what you love. People care about those landscapes, those species, those places. They have long histories there and intend to be there for many generations to come. You protect what you love. So there's this tremendous emotional and spiritual kind of intersection here with, you know, the technical aspects of conservation or, you know, the economic value of, of, of certain practices. You know, this, this very emotional, spiritual connectedness is also critically important. Um, some key, key issues here in Alberta, uh, you know, the lack of, lack of recognition of lands and resource rights of, of uh, Dene Cree, Métis, Soto uh, peoples, uh, you know, lack of respect uh, for treaty rights, you know, across the board, uh, very, very clear that we have a long way to go in, in simply even seeing those rights, understanding them as another level entirely and, and really legislating respect for 
um, an adherence to treaty rights is is a is a critical challenge. Um, also, the there there's tremendous mistrust uh, and historical traumas that have have existed and developed uh, in many communities um, over the last 100, 200, 300 years. And um, the kinds of impacts of uh, you know, assimilation, colonization, uh, the ways in which that has led to the marginalization of, of Indigenous peoples from schools, from government, from other kinds of um, uh, institutions, from the economy, that, that's a multi-layered um, history that needs to be addressed. Uh, you know, we're still seeing, obviously, as it shows in the news, uh, the systemic racism, racism as well. We kind of have to name it, um, as many others have uh, over the last um, few months to to the two years. Um, you know, the poor represent representation of of people in in different um, institution is one issue, but then. The, the, the very clear biases and kinds of violences that exist. Um, you know, hit stories that I hear about, you know, non-Indigenous uh, people threatening uh, hunters and elders uh, who are practicing their treaty rights to harvest, right? There, you know, the, the violence and the fear that comes from those um, systemic kinds of racisms are, are not a small issue. Um, the current resource management system also is highly flawed and biased in terms of who wins and who loses. And these are, these are issues which I've identified from the literature, but also from previous um, work we've, we've done. Um, you know, there are clear benefits and negative effects from certain kinds of institutions, uh, you know, winners and losers. Um, and certainly, you know, the benefits have been inequitably distributed. Uh, where Indigenous peoples lose subsistence harvest rights, lose access to cultural sites, lose um, territory uh, because they're forced into reserve lands and uh, no longer have access to, to areas that are critically important. Um, conflicts, uh, conflicts are critically um, uh, important to address, um, you know, over, over things like harvesting, uh, which is kind of a pinch point where we see all of these issues kind of come together. The harvesting of, of fish, the harvesting of caribou, the harvesting of other species. Uh, so there's kind of a pinch point there. Um, but there's also kind of a pinch point when we're thinking about institutions and decision-making conflicts between Indigenous knowledge and science. Um, um, so the, that's another key issue uh, in which tend to tend to see tremendous weight being put on kind of conventional forms of science uh, versus traditional knowledge generated from from communities. I just had a conversation with somebody yesterday when I shared some references for a project which will remain nameless, but the person asked me, you know, are those, is that real knowledge that's being shared in those academic references and the research, evidence-based research by Indigenous communities, where, where is the real knowledge? Um, and I found that tragically telling. Um, the lack of fit between informal and informal institutions. Our friend Christine Ray, who is on this call right now, I think um, did her master's degree in Northern Canada and looking at um, the fit between Gwich'in rules for managing caribou, for example, and uh, territorial government rules for managing caribou and analyzing the the degree of fit you know what what kinds of rules take precedent over others what kinds of rules are synergistic what kind of rules kind of are at odds um, so that's an important consideration uh, the capacity of indigenous people to engage in co-management cooperative management also uh, lack of resources um, lack of supports in different ways for people to participate in decision making, you know, the, the armies of scientists that exist that are pumped out of the University of Alberta and other institutions compared to, uh, you know, the, the ways in which, you know, Indigenous knowledge holders are or are not recognized or have resources to participate is certainly an equity, an equity issue um, that through a recognition of the um, truth and reconciliation and the calls to action that you know, the university and other institutions are trying to address. But certainly thinking about co-management boards in which you have 
scientists paid by government to sit on those boards, but Indigenous knowledge holders, you know, volunteer or, you know, are paid a small honoraria from time to time to, to show up or, you know, state their, their case, you know, is a very inequitable sort of socioeconomic situation. Um, so three case studies, I'm not sure how much, oh, I'm running out of time. Uh, the three kind of just showing some some case study work that that um, has come up as being critically important um, in discussions with our friends and colleagues who um, uh, are going to lead community-based research projects in northern Canada or sorry northern Alberta is you know one one sort of starting point is recognition of the Alberta landscape as a cultural landscape and um, certainly if you look at the, any map of Alberta and you have a look at the names on that on that map you know where did where did those names come from um, you know to what extent do they represent um, indigenous histories or do they re represent the colonial experience um, I'm not sure if Kevin's on the call uh, but talked about the the um, the, the place assumption north of in, in Denita First Nations and the the you know assumption was a residential school that every time people pass the sign on the highway um, you know there was additional trauma experienced by by people who had negative experiences at the residential school um, you know, our friends from Mosquachis previously described defined by the by European settlement as Hobima was named after a Dutch painter nothing to do with uh, the community or the people who live there. Uh, Moskwachis is, I'm gonna get it wrong, I see Robins there. Uh, bear, uh, is it bear country, Robin? I'll get it wrong. But uh, my Cree is terrible. So that's that's something that we're trying to, to address and, and Robin House, who's one of our master students, is very interested as Charlene and Kevin are in um, Indigenous place names work. There's another example here of uh, from Charlene, Bear Hills, thank you, Robin. Uh, there's another place name listed here. Um, Charlene and has been doing some, some workshops with elders. Uh, you know, lots of these place names have lots of insights about the ecology of what's going on in the system um, or in the province, you know, the history, uh, a, a lake um, that's called in Cree, I'm gonna mess it up, Manateo Sakoik, and I'm terrible at my Cree, sorry, um, is, it means lake where you can draw water or drink from your hand, or that was the sort of meaning around that particular place. You know, the fact that you can no longer drink the water from that place uh, is very telling to people about the kinds of ecological impacts that have occurred in some of the, the you know, the histories of change. And so that's critically important um, to sort of understand those, those histories of place. So a lot of, there's a lot of passion um, coming out of some other projects and work that Kevin Akamachi did, or, you know, beginning in 2017 around place. Um, and it's a critical starting point and certainly something that um, Charlene and Robin and others are, are super interested in. Um, another key issue uh, many of you are familiar with or some of you uh, is the issue of chronic waste and disease um, and the impacts on food security. We have been working with different communities in Treaty 6 and Treaty 8 territory around um, wildlife disease and sort of the broader um, kinds of issues surrounding uh, wildlife harvesting and food security. And with Alan Goddard, who I think is on this call, we submitted a paper for publication recently based on 10 years of, of survey data. Um, Kevin is involved in that uh, paper and at the behest of the Treaty 8 leadership, um, sort of identified some key um, needs in terms of publishing that, that paper, publishing that data. Um, given that harvesting is a complicated political issue, we didn't want to go ahead and publish harvest data without that kind of thumbs up from leadership. Um, but the paper talks specifically about, you know, food security and the risk created by chronic wasting disease. And there's four levels of kind of jeopardy that we identify. Uh, you know, the presence of chronic wasting disease in, in the province creates worries and leads to 
you know, a decreased connection to the land and, and um, interest and capacity to harvest species where people become fearful of, of um, you know, harvesting food that was once a source of, of well-being, of health, of life, now is a risk. Uh, now is something to be fr uh, fearful of. Um, and so that's a really uh, critical, critical dimension of, of, the, of the story. Uh, secondly, you know, recognizing that there's another level of jeopardy in the sense that, I'm not sure I like the word jeopardy anymore, I'll have to rethink that, but um, the extent to which Indigenous peoples depend heavily on, on um, wild meat uh, for food security and um, so we sort of see statistically there's a disproportionate reliance on on wild meat and consequently a disproportionate risk to Indigenous peoples who uh, again harvest those species for food security. Uh, there's also some some messy kind of um, other kind of jeopardies or, or problems um, that increase the impact of CWD on food security uh, in the sense that Indigenous peoples are kind of inadvertently or have inadvertently been left out of um, you know the enterprise of testing that's gone on over the last 10 years um, and although there's been a concerted effort to, to test animals in WMU areas um, it's largely been a requirement uh, it is a requirement of, of, of the province that anyone with a tag to hunt um, has to submit those heads for testing if they're in the WMU that is uh, affected. Um, but by, by the fact that Indigenous communities don't need hunting tags or hunting licenses, um, there's been no imposition of that requirement for testing. Um, so we see inadvertently it's unintentional, but kind of this skew in terms of the the number of people that have had animals tested and consequently some assurance that the animal is not infected. Most of all, if um, most of that is um, uh, um, been to the benefit of non-Indigenous people. Um, so, and then there's also this kind of incongruity that exists between the province and the federal government around health, right, which falls under the responsibility of the federal government, Health Canada. Um, you know, risks of, of disease and illness and, and some of the relationships that Indigenous people on reserve have to the federal government. You know, on the other hand, wildlife management, management of CWD, it falls to the province. And so there's kind of this incongruity or gap that exists um, to, be, to be reconciled. So that's another issue. How do we solve that in the context? You know, how is cooperative management possible? Um, in that context, or how might co-management, cooperative management address that issue. The third case study related to fisheries, and my friend Mark Poe should be still talking to me because I haven't been able to answer his email, um, might uh, certainly have has a lot of interesting things to say about this, this case study, as do our colleagues who, who are from the Slave Lake area, Lesser Slave Lake. Um, the, there's a long history of commercial fishing in the Lesser Slave Lake area, which began, you know, at the time of treaty uh, signing, um, you know, peaked uh, in some ways in the 1930s and 40s uh, as a result of commercial fishing and the um, harvest of um, feed fish, Cisco, for mink farmers in the area, which I know my friend Vic Adamovich also has uh, insights about that um, period in history. Uh, you know, it resulted in you know, essentially an over harvesting of or an extirpation of um, trout in the lake and, uh, you know, changed irrevocably the, the relationship of people to that fishery, the Cree to the fishery. Um, you know, now the lake is largely managed as a recreational fishing area. It's recognized, you know, as a, an important um, 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 area of biodiversity, but also for recreational fishing, <laughs> fishing and camping by um, Joe Edmontonian, you know, and that kind of recreational land use activity and, and uh, recreational fishing, right, runs contrary or, or is a barrier to um, Indigenous people and their rights and use of that area. So just in terms of solutions, thinking about, you know, where, where does this leave us? You know, some, some, brief kind of comments in terms of um, 
uh, solutions? Is it possible? Is it not possible? You know, are, are we open to recognizing the histories of colonization that have shaped the current kinds of land and resource management systems we have? Are people open to change? Is that really something that's, that is um, on the table or are we kind of on Arnstein's ladder pretty low on that spectrum? Um, you know, to what extent, you know, can we, we talk about property rights, the recognition of Indigenous land rights, land tenure, um, you know, this, this kind of certainty that exists over rights is critical as our economics friends know to um, creating some, some certainty and, and um, creating incentives for investments, not only in um, this, those lands and resources being a benefit to community, but also benefit to conservation or producing conservation outcomes, i.e. it prevents a kind of tragedy of open access by the public. Uh, you know, there's also the need for healing and trust building. You know, we can talk about the technical aspects of, of managing a species or a particular place, but you know, the, the softer dimensions of, of trust building, of, of reconciliation, I think cannot be uh, un overstated. And then, you know, more specifically think about the recognition of, of expertise within communities. We, we tend to heavily bias decisions in, around um, science rather than recognizing local communities as having expert knowledge. And I think that that also um, is something that can be addressed um, through these kinds of conversations. Um, and then, you know, the, at the end of the day, kind of figuring out what, what, where can there be improved equity in how resource management decisions are made, you know, who's benefiting, who's not from certain kinds of decisions, you know, what's the fit between, you know, the, the customary law or the cultural um, laws that people have that need to be respected and, and that of the province and federal government, like how do we fit those things together jigsaw puzzle wise in ways that are meaningful and respectful. Um, so that's a, that's a critical piece as well. So these are, these are some of our ideas to date uh, about, the, um, about the project. I'm not sure people want to um, comment or, or talk. I realize my kids now are gone from um, my hallway so I can think straight, which is nice. I need a soundproof door, I, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Any question, comments? I'm sure there are comments. Please unmute yourself and speak. No comments? No comments. Friday afternoon. I, I had a question in the chat about um, whether there's IPCAs in Treaty 6. I might have missed, I missed the first couple minutes of the, of the talk here, but um, is there any examples? So I'm working with a community that's trying to get an IPCA sort of or co-management thing set up. And it's like when you're working with the Alberta government, they kind of give you the token. Yeah, sure. We'll kind of maybe think of that, but really we have our preferred land users and you're not one of them. Right, right. So they're kind of like, well, what do you, what would you like to see? What would you like to see? And, you know, and this is in treaty six, actually this is in treaty seven and there's just so much competition for land use. And so what are you supposed to say? There's nothing to point to and you know, it's, it's, you just hit this wall. And do you have any recommendations for groups to talk to that might be able to support us when we're trying to get something designated like that? Um, I'm not sure if our friend um, Scott Duguid is on the call, but that may, Kevin is there. Mr. Jones, would you be able to comment or go Yeah, Kevin is here. Kevin? I mean, he's here. Oh, sorry, Gleb or? or. Nice. Okay, I can't see how many people are here, but um, you know, it's it's not necessarily an easy um, an easy opportunity to create an indigenous protected area, in especially under the current government. Um, so, courage, as they say in French, uh, in terms of doing that kind of work, um, 
In terms of my recommendations, I don't have any at the moment, except to the extent that, um, and now I'm talking um, like based on other conversations I've had, maybe my friends in the government can just close their ears for a second, but just the, the um, efforts that are being made in other parts of the country and other parts of the world where people essentially just do it, right? You just, just create a protected area in, in different um, customary terms and work to um, ensure that those laws that are critical to um, the community you're working with in Treaty 6 are, are respected and, you know, on a daily basis, uh, you know, fight to ensure that those, um, those rules, those, those principles of conservation that are key to the community are, are respected. Um, you know, whether or not there's an IPCA, quote unquote, in a formal agreement with, with the government, it may take longer than you want. Um, and, you know, so that would be coming from another conversation I had this week with a community in another province. That's kind of what they're working towards is kind of we can't wait to get the formal piece of paper. We have to just do it. And so that would be a suggestion. I'm not sure. Krista or others with the government that are on the call that can now unplug their ears, <laughs> what, what they would say to that, or Mr. Gleb. Any comments? Actually, I had a, a question. I mean, it's a naive question, right? But. Uh, I'm really convinced about the, the, the value, the tremendous value of uh, indigenous knowledge. But I always um, wonder how you basically transform this knowledge into something that can be understood by non-indigenous people. Um, because because for, for indigenous, it makes sense, right? Um, but how do, how do you, is there a need of a third party that tried to translate this into workable knowledge that non-indigenous can adopt? Like, I, I like the, the saying that you had saying, uh, uh, you, you just take what you need, right? Um, but it, for non-indigenous, it may, be, it may sound okay. Uh, you know, I mean, even though we have a good goodwill, right? People who are not bad faith, they still want to know a little bit what that means exactly. Um, is that, what are the efforts basically that are made to uh, try to move this knowledge into the, and is this something that is being uh, tried to do? I mean, that people try to do actively try to do? Um. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 this is a sort of broad overview of some issues and kind of just highlights from the literature. But, you know, if you were to work with, you know, a particular person or community, kind of get the, the details of, you know, how those systems actually work and a much better insight, um, you know, about, you know, take only what you need, what that means in the context of, say, caribou hunting in the Northwest Territories or, you know, fishing in the Athabasca, Lake Athabasca, or, you know, there are, there are the, it's very place specific. And so can't really generalize uh, too much, but I think, you know, my bigger frustration and others can chime in is just thinking about the way in which sometimes people think about indigenous knowledge as not evidence-based, that it's not based on, um, you know, it's based on opinion or something mystical entirely that nobody can understand. And, you know, at, there are lots of dimensions, but, you know, at a very basic level, you know, it is, it is science and it's, you know, based on empirical observation. Like this is, uh, I've said before, you know, my colleague who is a caribou hunter near Lut in Lutzelke, you know, he's been hunting in the same places using the same tactics of observation, using the same indicators to evaluate caribou health, you know, using the same methods 
um, for the last 70 years. And they're based on what his grandfather did before him. So the, the observations, the, the knowledge that he's created from essentially that systematic empirical process of watching the land or being a guardian of the land, as Val says, you know, is, is essentially a kind of science that, you know, the, you know, the average biologist should be able to recognize, but the extent to which, well, those methods are systematic, but they're not, you know, sanctioned by the Conservation Biology Association or, you know, your indicators sound interesting, but we've got, you know, other measurements that we use, right? So there's, you know, some, some challenges just e even in basically recognizing that that hunter who's been watching caribou for 70 years has good knowledge of, as evidence about, about that species that rivals, you know, the, you know, the, the guy that got a degree from Dalhousie or wherever. And there's lots of biologists in the North that recognize that. For example, Susan Coots, our colleague from the University of Calgary, just published a paper this past year in science with her student, Tom Selly, I think it's her student, anyway, called um, uh, Two-Eyed Seeing, which is a, a concept that was defined or coined um, on the East Coast, but essentially recognizing the value of science and Indigenous knowledge and working together. So when you have Indigenous measures of caribou health and you have science measures of caribou health, and you merge the two together. Wow, that's pretty awesome. Um, so there are lots of great biologists that are doing great work um, that are fascinated by and want to, wanting to learn from, from the, the evidence of communities. There are also others that do not. So I think it comes down to whether, whether people are fundamentally able to open their minds to sort of another way of seeing things. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kevin has a question, I think. Kevin? Yeah, hi, Brenda. Thanks for the, the, the talk. I'm uh, sorry if I'm going to ask a question that you've already, you've already answered. I've been chasing kids in and out of my office all afternoon here. Um, I, I kind of had two. One was, you know, stewardship and conservation cost long-term money beyond just the kind of procurement of a or protection of a territory. Um, so I, I was kind of curious to get a sense of the ways in which um, Indigenous communities are providing uh, or, or finding access to the, the, the funds to do long-term stewardship monitoring. Um, Great uh, question. Um, but the second part of that is, you know, often, and this is coming from my role as a director on the Edmonton Area Land Trust, is that science becomes the gatekeeper to getting to those funds. Mm -hmm. So we, we always are playing the biodiversity game, even though we're protect lands for far broader values than biodiversity, but biodiversity becomes the means by which we need to apply for grant, government grants for, right. um, for example. So the second part of the question is, is how do you um, bring those alternate kinds of values and experiences and knowledge as you're talking about into a kind of a, a formal Western science-based system to get access to, to grants and resources? Wicked, wicked questions, both of them. Uh, the first one, um, you know, it's interesting kind of scenario if you look at what's gone on in um, Fort Chippewan, for example, or in Northern Alberta around the impacts of oil sands and, um, you know, the extent to which communities there felt like, saw that, received no indication that there was any respect for their knowledge um, um, and um, felt like they weren't included in the monitoring of oil sands development on their lands and the associated health impacts, for example, on fish, you know, the conflict, which you probably remember also, you know, the doctor that identified white fish um, and people as having higher levels of some rare cancers, right? It sort of came to a point at, at that stage when that the doctor came out with that story. Um, but essentially the lack of, of cooperation with the province and the federal government around resolving that, um, and now I'm, I'm oversimplifying the scenario, but essentially Mikasu and Athabasca Chippewan First Nation developed their own monitoring programs and now consequently have money from other sources other than the province. There is cer certainly now with the province better relationships and supports, but you know the community-based monitoring program that they have um, 
you know, it has had funding from movie stars and, you know, large international NGOs and also NGOs like Ducks Unlimited and that work heavily here in Alberta. You know, so so people are finding different ways to fund those. And it, as I said early on in the presentation, like there's this global interest, right? Stemming from UNDRIP and stemming from other sorts of issues that people are very supportive of Indigenous rights, more so in Canada than here in Alberta. So we're sort of behind the eight ball. And so there's this gap. If, if the government of Alberta does not move you know, there are going to be other people that fill that gap and other organizations and other governments. So, you know, that, that would be my first, you know, and there's other cases of that as well in the Northwest Territories. Tlutuget and a First Nation has a, has a land trust related to the, the current protected area that they have, which is now actually a national park. That land trust, you know, there are, are some well-known movie stars and organizations internationally that have contributed large amounts of money to supporting stewardship in those areas. So Kevin, the other guy that was asking me a question, Mr. Potter, um, you know, that might also be an opportunity as well to think about that. Um, you know, so it's this question of indigenous communities and governments are so far apart in terms of what they think are the issues and the best practices for, for management or monitoring you know, what's, what's happened over the last 10 years is super interesting sociologically in the sense of other organizations start to fill that gap, right? The creation of allies, you know, indigenous allies is really interesting. Um, on the second point, also good question. We are in the process and some of my students are in this call will have heard me talk about this way too many times, but you know, the, the polar bear conservation issue, the extent, extent to which science uh, and certainly the science of our colleagues from this university has kind of dominated narratives about population decline of bears, right? Has been extremely frustrating to Inuit and Inuyawit people who have other knowledge of bears and other, uh, again, systematic observation um, of population dynamics, migration movements, et cetera, of bears, of health of bears, you know, the number of bears that are are reproducing two and even three cubs. I was just talking to a colleague of mine from Arviat this past month, like the, there's a complete disconnect between the science and Inuit knowledge about bears. And there are a, a bunch of us, um, you know, there's been a, a number of studies published um, by indigenous organizations that are gray literature, like reports, but as you pointed out, the name of the game and getting people's attention is, you know, to have an academic publication. So we're starting to um, work on a paper now where one of the Inuvialuit leaders who led the co-management board of the Inuvialuit for decades uh, is going to be a co or a lead author on, on a paper about polar bear population dynamics in the South Beaufort and, um, you know, recognizing Frank Pokiak being the first author on that on that paper in some big journal, you know, will kind of address some of that inequity, you know, and I'm seeing that in my friend Renato Silvano, I think is on this call where, you know, with IP best, we're also the intergovernmental platform biodiversity and ecosystem services struggling with that same issue where there's a mandate to include both science and indigenous knowledge in the assessment that's going on right now in sustainable use. But the number of scientific papers that are published, for example, about polar bears, just as a, carry on that example, by scientists from Wisconsin, California, Australia, and Alberta versus the number of publications from Inuit people. Um, you, know, you can imagine the skew, right? So the IPBAS assessment, which is supposed to be based on you know, published literature, essentially evidence, is highly you know, by virtue of just numbers of publications is messed up that way. <laughs> so, so that's something that's a big challenge. And, you know, in other things I've published, you know, I have tried to, like the CWD paper would be an example. And then the pub, pub, publication I had in Science Advances two years ago, in the community felt like they were not being heard. Multiple communities were not being heard that the, you know, the bureaucratic science was dominating discussions about caribou management to the disadvantage of local people. So we published a paper based on harvest data and 
indigenous knowledge in a big journal that got some media attention. So, you know, that's something that I'm trying to do to level some of that out, but certainly your observation that things are skewed uh, and that the name of the game is publishing is certainly very, very telling, you know, or is, is bang on in terms of some of the issues that I think anyway, these are all just my reflections. Others may have other comments. Any comments? Please don't be shy. Maybe Renato, who is also involved in the IPBES process. I do have a comment. Um, this is John from before. Uh, just a little bit of clarification on the IPCA that we're trying to get. It's a rare opportunity where a private, a large chunk of private land becomes public land, nice. which you don't often see, which is why this is such a rare opportunity. And to speak to the last question is like, well, where do you get money to get land for IPCAs? You know, and that's kind of the huge hurdle that, you know, you can't make them because there's really, it's, it's a struggle to find the, the capital to do that kind of thing. Whereas, you know, in this case, it's the opposite where it's going to a public, hey, you know, here's a great opportunity. Wow, that is a cool opportunity. Yeah, it'd be great to chat more about that with you. If you want to email me, maybe there's some other conversations we could have. Yeah, absolutely. I can uh, connect you to the land manager who of the band that I'm talking with. Nice. How fun. What a great opportunity, as you said. I know there's been a, other work that our friend Peter Boxall did and Vic was also involved in that, uh, you know, looking at different, maybe Vic can correct me if I'm wrong, the work that you guys did in Australia in terms of private land and different kinds of in, investments and incentives towards conservation. Maybe Vic has left the yeah. No, I'm still here. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure which work. I mean, I think Peter and I and others have done work on uh, the uh, stuff I was thinking of. The, the compensation for ecosystem yeah. services. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, there, there are lots of different mechanisms and examples and they all have pluses and minuses. Um, but usually the, the active programs actually have some identified funding source and whether it's here or in Australia. Um, you know, whether it's offset payments that are developed because a city or a region has said, we're not going to let you drain wetlands unless you provide funds to then support generation of new wetlands. But I mean, maybe I can turn this back into, into a question. I don't actually know of, of good examples where those types of projects have been um, conducted with indigenous communities. There probably are some in, in Australia. I know there are, there are a number of issues around water and access to water, but that's, uh, I don't know if you know of any that, that have specifically focused on ecosystem service provision from, from indigenous community and partly because um, property rights thoughts are different. And yeah. that's, uh, that, that creates a, a different framework for how one might actually provide funding for uh, mechanisms, you know, with, with private land in Southern Alberta, it's pretty straightforward. Public land, it's always been a challenge to actually develop offsets yeah. and um, land um, with indigenous communities would present even a bigger challenge. So I don't know if you have any examples, but it'd be good to know about that. Um, I haven't done a huge amount of work around that. I know there's, there's some in the United States around water and water conservation. Um, but I was, I was also talking to a colleague from the NWT who was involved in the development of the, um, the Lutzelke National Park. Um, and he's doing work on carbon, off, like looking at carbon offsets. So for example, and this sounds maybe not the direction you want to go, Mr. Potter, but um, you know, thinking about, you know, Shell Oil has a lot of, a lot of investments they'd like to make to, to appear more green or, I'm going to get the language wrong, Vic, but basically to, uh, in terms of carbon, you know, and so Shell Oil will invest in said national park as, you know, evidence of how it's reducing or offsetting its carbon footprint. Um, and basically in this, you know, using Lutzelke as an example, Lutzelke gets the funding to continue to support the, the protection 
of the park and to do their monitoring and to do sort of other wildlife conservation work. But Shell Oil's paying, but they, you know, the incentive is that they get the, you know, the, the benefit of the carbon offset. So some people don't like it. There's a colleague of ours, Glebnos, in, in Scandinavia who doesn't like it. But, um, you know, there are maybe opportunities there, Mr. Potter. Yeah, actually, if I can just follow up, Brenda, there. Um, again, I don't know the details, but there was an attempt to do something similar with uh, the Little Red River Tall Creek First mm. Nations. But I don't know if they were ever successful. I know they had that proposal around carbon credits and they were partnering with the, with the forestry FMA holder. I'm right. not sure if they were ever able to pull that one together. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I don't know enough about sort of what, why I, I remember now there was some discussion, but I don't know enough about why it kind of went sideways. Um, yeah, certainly the, the timing might be right uh, to have those discussions with some companies that haven't left Alberta. <laughs> um, yeah, there may be other, other thoughts about, you know, the funding model, you know, there's the benevolent NGOs that give money for different things, but um, you know, there may be other kinds of investments in certain kinds of protected areas. You know, if we are to believe Justin Trudeau, he'd like to create more, more, um, more um, protected areas, you know, in, in line with the Convention on Biological Diversity. But, you know, someone like Val Courtois from the Indigenous Leadership Initiative is, is a mastermind around some of these things. And she's, um, yeah, incredible in terms of how she has built networks out of Labrador and has, you know, as I said, kind of the Harrison Fords and other, um, you know, really interesting NGO organizations involved in supporting work that's going on in Labrador, but also this broader Guardians Network. So, you know, it may be, again, um, not to keep responding to Mr. Potter, but, you know, that might also be an opportunity in thinking about uh, talking to Val as well as ILI about how that protected area might fit within the context of some of the things they're doing. Yeah, and uh, they do, they have over the last 20 years received certain amounts of money from the pipelines and the the, the various oil and gas companies and they've for, they've created investments in the lands so they have a number of acres that they have been purchasing and managing but that management of the land has to come with a return so typically it gets uh, it gets leased off and you know that's the problem you know it's 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 a it's a one time if you have a chunk of money and then it's kind of like well can we use this to support our community members or do we put it towards you and IPCA? So it's a bit of a balance, of course, but. Right. right. Yeah. Great. Well, I mean, it could be, you know, what is the benefit of the IPCA? Like what is the ultimate hope in terms of how is it, you know, long-term conservation of a particular resource or area of land for cultural reasons, or is there, you know, if it's for a particular species or a species at risk, for example, and maybe leverage there, um, you know, in, t in terms of attracting other support and, and, and also like on the community benefits side, like there may be, you know, by engaging, say, in this larger network of ILI, Indigenous Leadership Initiative or others, you know, the benefit of, you know, many communities working towards the same goal can be really powerful as well, you know, as kind of a, you know, for youth, especially different ideas about their their future or their possible roles or employment opportunities as guardians and that kind of thing. Yeah. And that's the direction they certainly want to go in. So maybe ILA would be a good uh, group to, to start that conversation with. Super. Thanks Vic. Okay. Any last comments, questions? So thank you, Brenda. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. So uh, in two weeks, uh, we'll have another brown bag. Uh, and this is going to be very different than today. It's going to be application of machine, machine learning in the finance industry.
So, but uh, it will be, I promise, very interesting. Uh, I especially encourage students to uh, attend uh, because there would be a, a possibility of applying what's, what's going to be pr uh, presented. Thank you again, Brenda. And thank you to everybody for attending and uh, participating to this uh, uh, wonderful seminar. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'm happy to chat more if people want to email me. I'm visible on the U of A directory, which I just updated, which Deborah will be happy to know. <laughs> Super. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Brenda. Thank you, Brenda. Bye. Thank, thank, <laughs> thanks, thanks, Renato. <laughs> Great to hear you. See you. <laughs> Good to hear, hear you, too. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you. Oh, nice to see you, Michelle. How are you doing? Oh, fine, thanks. And Terry's thanks, with me. Brenda. <laughs> Hi, Terry. How are you? I'm giving Good you a vir Thank you. virtual oh. hug. Virtual yeah, hug. That's right. <laughs> took me back 10 years to all the work that uh, went on with the SFM on many of these related issues. Yes, yes, I can imagine. Yeah, it's, it's exciting, but sometimes sad to sort of see you know, over time, <laughs> some things have changed and some people are still having the same conversations. Thanks yeah, again. So great yeah, work. Thank you Excellent. so much. Take care. Bye -bye.